has sold over 450 million records worldwide and worked with some of the biggest names in music. Chief Marketing Officer of House of Darien and founded Music World Films and TV, which oversees a $275 million fund. So imagine George Wallace is the governor. Uh, I'm in elementary school. I never went to a black school. You mentioned something. It was responsible for the, the successes and the failures in, in your life and your career. To be the best in corporate America, transition into the music industry, be one of the best executives and managers in the music industry, to have the opportunity to manage Destiny's Child. Doing integration, the only people that really integrated were black people. And it's the number one reason, Scott, why startups fail. Welcome to Success Story. I'm your host, Scott Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. They supported the show for over two years now, and I've used HubSpot for the majority of my professional career. One of the most useful tools that is included in the HubSpot suite of products is Sales Hub. Sales Hub is an all-in-one platform built with the tools and insights that you need to communicate on a personal level with every lead, every prospect, every customer. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're building, Sales Hub makes it easier to close more deals and drive more revenue. If you're looking for a better way to acquire customers, and we all are because that is the lifeblood of our business, if you're looking to make smart, data-driven decisions, increase visibility, productivity, predictability of your revenue, you got to look at Sales Hub. It can organize and sort deals in your pipeline. It creates reminder tasks for your most important deadlines. It manages leads. It automates outreach. It tracks and closes deals all in one place. And on top of that, it's free to get started and it grows with your business as it scales. There's 1,300 integrations and a ton of valuable add-ons. Customize it exactly to your needs. With Sales Hub, closing deals is no longer a big deal. Go to HubSpot.com slash sales and try it for free. Today, my guest is Matthew Knowles. Matthew is a music industry veteran who has produced over 100 award-winning platinum and gold albums in multiple genres, including pop, R&B, gospel, dance, and country. He has sold over 450 million records worldwide and worked with some of the biggest names in music, including none other than Beyonce and Solange Knowles, as well as several other multi-platinum award-winning artists. He is a successful businessman. He served various roles in various organizations, including Chief Marketing Officer of House of Darien and founded Music World Films and TV, which oversees a $275 million fund for new film and television incentives. With an MBA and PhD in business administration, Knowles has held professorships at several universities and colleges. He also serves on over 10 boards and is a minority owner of the 2021 WNBA champions, Chicago Sky. Pick a point in your life, in your career, could have been when you were very young, it could have been uh, maybe when you're a little bit older, there was a major realization, a major inflection point that sort of pushed you to where you are today. What's something that was very memorable for you that shifted your perspective, your mindset, that sort of altered the course of, of what you were trying to accomplish? Well, for me, Scott, it really happened in, in that defining moment. It, it happened for me very young. Uh, I grew up in Gaston, Alabama, uh, and I was born in 1952. So that meant that in 1958, way before you were born, (laughs) they knew a little bit. Yeah. In 1958, um, I was in elementary school. So imagine George Wallace is the governor. Uh, I'm in elementary school. I never went to a black school, Scott, until my junior year of college, which meant in 58, I was integrating elementary then junior high, then high school, Gaston High, then University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. The defining moment for me actually was uh, at Litchfield Junior High, Junior High School. It was my first day, and I uh, my first class was English. And I went in there and, and, and sat 
you know, wanted to be kind of discreet and quiet and sat in the middle of the class. And then I was asked to read a paragraph out of Shakespeare, uh, which I, I really bumbled really bad. And all the white kids laughed at me uh, through spitballs. That was a defining moment for me that I said that would never again happen. I would work very hard to be the very best at what I did, regardless of what it was, and to get the respect deserved. How did that impact your career, what you pursued, what your passions were? Obviously, that's a super traumatic event in anyone's life, and that's something that I'll never have to experience. I would never even understand the mindset of somebody that would go through that. So I want to understand how that impacted your life decisions. Did this create a chip on your shoulder that you actually found benefited a lot of the things that you took on? How did this actually play out? Yeah. Well, it, what it didn't do was put a chip on my shoulder. It just wanted me to work harder. Uh, it, it wanted me, and, and you said it with a key word, trauma. Uh, I ended up going to therapy almost 10 years uh, and it was only until the third or fourth year when I changed therapists uh, and for the first time had a black male therapist that I understood that it was the racial trauma that was impacting me. Now, you know, it's interesting because my, my therapist said that because of that racial trauma is why I've been so successful and because of that racial trauma, is why I've screwed up sometimes in my life. And, and fortunately, I've gotten past that. But, but that's how it impacted me. And it impacted me in other ways by always being the first. For example, I was the first black uh, to be in a medical division of Xerox and, and to uh, gratefully be the number one sales rep worldwide three years out of four. Uh, and I could go on and on, the first black to sell MRI CT scanners in America. So it impacted me in that way to to really want to excel, and not with a chip, uh, but with 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 just wanting to be the very best of what I did to do the work, to do the research. That's so interesting. Um, you mentioned something. You was responsible for the the successes and the failures in your life and your career, and and it still is. You know, as you mentioned that you, you know you mentioned when you were born, and obviously you're, you're slightly older than I am, but you're not. You're not exceptionally old. It's not like this was. Hey, Rob. It was not like this was like in a different universe in a in a different yeah. time. It's it's you know whatever a couple of years ago, which is scary as hell. It really is. But now you start to think about the successes and the failures. So what did this um, this trauma create in your life? What successes were a derivative of this trauma? What failures were a derivative of this trauma? And and also I'm super curious when whenever I speak to somebody who was like the first like you you were first. Uh, black man who's done this and that and this and that. Um, how far have we progressed? How far have we, like, what's the what's the difference in today's society? What's different? What hasn't changed? Super curious as to your, expect, you, you know, your perspective, because you, you lived through a lot of everything, really. Yeah. So you asked me seven questions. I was curious. I know I did. I'm super curious. I'm so sorry. I'm super, okay, let's start with one. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> Give me one. <laughs> I got you. I got you. So, so what? Give me one of the questions. Okay. Let's say, let's say the traumas, the trauma that you experienced as a child, how did that impact the success and the failure? Yeah. Well, that trauma again is what led me, for example, to be the best in corporate America, uh, to transition into the music industry and to be one of the best executives and managers. Uh, in the music industry to to have the opportunity to manage Destiny's Child, who uh, are the number one female group of all time, to have managed Beyonce, who is without question the number one female artist and, and the, the GOAT who's won more Grammys than anyone in the history of music. Um, it, it's those type of things. But also there was a period uh, about 13... 14 years ago where I imploded uh, and I imploded in relationships, my marriage um, and I had to, to rectify that and I had to 
That's why I saw help for myself. I thought I talk all the time about therapy. Some people get really uptight about it. Um, some people view it as a weakness. I don't. I view it as a strength. I, I view it as an opportunity. And when you asked about failure, you know, in one of my books, The DNA of Achievers, I talk about the 10 traits of highly successful professionals. And one of those is learning from mistakes and learning from failure. And understanding, Scott, that those are opportunities, opportunities for us to grow rather than quit. Uh, we often want to have a life free from trouble, but what we really should focus on is triumph over trouble. Um, and oftentimes we we don't look at it that way. And so then the follow-up question to that, because I did ask seven questions in a row, and it's just so it's so um, it's so much ingrained in part of the DNA of your origin story. So I think it's important to unpack the reality then versus the reality now. So young black professionals, are you optimistic about the changes that have happened over the last fifty years? When you work with young black professionals, entrepreneurs, artists, people that are trying to build something from scratch, because I've spoken to a lot of different people and I'll give some context. I've spoken to um, I've spoken to uh, women that are underrepresented in venture capital and entrepreneurship. I've spoken to a founder of a black startup incubator and some of the stats are actually astonishing that I've only heard secondhand through some of the interviews I've done akin to uh, the massive uh, disproportionate amount of capital that has been funded into black entrepreneurs. Uh, something like in the history of startups, there's only been one or two black entrepreneurs that have received over a million dollars in seed stage funding, like mind blowing stats that don't quite compute. So when you hear that in 22, 2023, 20, all of a sudden you recognize the, you recognize that obviously we're not where we have to be, but also how far have we come? Well, it's a good question. You know, Scott, I, uh, for 18 years, have been uh, in academia also, uh, teaching at Cornell. I teach at Pepperdine now. Uh, I teach at the London College of Creative, Creative Media in London. I'm the dean at the African American uh, um, Museum uh, of Music in Nashville. Um, and, and so I, I work with young people, and I, I spend a lot of time in the black community as well. And I can tell you that it's really interesting, and I was trying to think of the, the correct word to use, how you're right. When I talk about entrepreneurship with a, a room full of black folks, uh, oftentimes our number one, as you know, Scott, access to capital is the number one thing for entrepreneurship. And if you don't have access to capital, it actually makes it extremely dis difficult to succeed. It's, it's a dual-edged sword. Sometimes it's the lack of knowledge and, and the lack of knowing how to even go about getting capital. Uh, that's why I like going out and speaking uh, uh, to, to, to all communities uh, about access to capital and, and what that means. Because if you don't have that, then it, again, it makes it extremely difficult. And it's the number one reason, Scott, why startups fail is lack of count. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 and when I look at what's happened over the years, I often say that during integration, the only people that really integrated were black people. We integrated. You know, we moved out into the white communities, and now you see white communities moving into the black communities. Um, and, and we have to you know when I grew up, we had black grocery stores, we had black, you know, attorneys and doctors and, and hair salons and nail salons. Uh, you don't see that anymore in a black community. Uh, so that by, that's what I mean when I say the only people that integrated were, were us. We, we integrated and allowed other communities to come and, and thrive economically in our communities. And I talk about that, and I think this is great, Scott, because this is the, the type of platform that I love because we can educate people off of time. It's a tough conversation always. It's always a, it's always a tough conversation because 
and I I want I didn't want to interrupt. I just want to like highlight how important it is to have these conversations because I know that it's like I mean you've written books on this, you speak on this. You're obviously somebody who has lived through this and overcome adversity regardless of of all the things that have been p- placed on you and your family. So is there is there potential and possibility for people who are underrepresented to succeed? Yes, but I mean it's not perfect. And then how do we, then the question then becomes like, how do we solve it? And I think to solve all the inequity in the world, I think conversations like this about realities that you experience every single day, that's how you solve. But people shy away from these conversations. Do they do, Scott? Uh, because again, for most black businesses, they go to the bank to try to borrow $100,000 uh, or $10,000 even. And I share it. I always get eyebrows raised. It's as you know, it's easier to raise ten million dollars than it is to raise fifty thousand. <laughs> a thousand percent. A thousand percent. People look at me like, "What the hell does he mean by that?" <laughs> if you if you know, you know. If you know, you know, bro. If you know, I know. So you know, I try to share that that wealth of knowledge with folks and others, help them understand the importance of putting together business plans and and really understanding marketing. Uh, which a lot of people really don't have a real depth. And I hope I can come back and really get into detail on um, entrepreneurship and marketing because it's an area of thought. No, we will. We will. We'll, don't 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 you worry, man. Don't you worry. I'm, I'm tapping into your I'm tapping into your marketing brain. I'm not letting you get away without learning a little bit because I need to listen, man. You built some of the biggest brands in the world. I got to learn a little bit. So, anyways, so. You know, you spoke about you spoke, and, and this is an interesting conversation about about traumas, traumas in your life that have benefited, uh, benefited you and hurt you. And I think a lot of that trauma has allowed you to uh, be the educator and the and the advisor to people that you are now. Because if you don't experience failure in your life, you you don't know how to teach other people how to overcome it. So um, let's continue on your journey, your path. You mentioned traumas in your life. Um, you dealt with major traumas in terms of your health and wellness, but walk me through, I guess, your mindset, your professional journey, how, uh, how you perceived success, how you perceived business success, and perhaps how that changed when you were diagnosed with cancer. What does that mean for you? Yeah, all of that changed once you I was diagnosed with cancer, and I think anyone has had any type of major illness, Scott, will agree with me. What was important before, those things don't be, become as important at all. Um, it's really about survivor, survival and, and the quality of life, because you want to have a, a, a great quality of life. And, you know, it was really interesting. You know, I talked about that I worked at Xerox Medical Systems. So, so for those of you that don't know, I was diagnosed for male breast cancer. Uh, I call it male chest cancer. We'll get into why I call it that. Uh, but, you know, as Xerox Medical System, guess what I saw? Zero radiography, which was the leading modality in the 80s for breast cancer. So there was one day, because we did a lot of extensive training, because I dealt with radiologists directly. Uh, and when it was one day in one of our training sessions, we normally had 30-day training sessions. We had a, a day on male breast cancer. And uh, it was optional at lunchtime if you wanted to come back or not. And um, almost all of the sales reps were, were male, so a lot of the guys decided not to come back at lunchtime. So I came back, and luckily I did it. Because it saved my life. You know, I, I understood at that moment that I had this nipple discharge. I knew exactly what it could be and called my doctor, who had never had a man in his 50 years of practice, asked for a mammogram. And, and I said, well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not at really asking for a mammogram. <laughs> I need you to, to refer me to get a mammogram. Because I, I have a hint that I think I know what it is. In that moment, and I actually looked up my 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 radio radiograph, and, and and I knew exactly when I looked at it what it was. So then I had a biopsy, and then I had the surgery all in the same week. Uh, and that absolutely changed my life 
Unfortunately, Scott, I was stage 1A, and, and cancer is in one, two, three, four stages. And the higher the number, the, the more challenging it is for recovery. So fortunately, I, I caught it very early. But I've always, Scott, been on this platform urging women uh, to get mammograms. I've always been on this, this platform talking about early detection um, for men and women with various diseases. So it, it was very um, mind-boggling, and I asked that question to myself, why me? Like, why would I get diagnosed with male breast cancer, all things? And, and I realized it was an opportunity that I could actually hopefully have a platform to even save lives. And at the end of the day, that's what's important. I love that. And, and honestly, when something like that happens, it totally shifts your perspective into to what's important. Like you mentioned, it just changes everything. And then you start to focus on health, wellness, support systems, family. And I'm actually, you know, it's a, it's a commentary on a lot of the people listed the show are, are entrepreneurs and a lot of them focus on nothing but their business. And I'm sure for a significant period of your life, that was very much you. I'm sure there was no there was no question of health or well. It was probably working nonstop. I mean, I can only imagine. Like if you're like anybody who's built anything, you're nonstop, you know, blinders on, focused, like where to next? What do we do next? And I think that this is a great reality check. Now I'm also curious you got out just the office. Really? I was just the office. Why? How? Explain. Explain how. Because that... for 20 years, I sold diagnostic imaging. You know, I sold MRI. I, I know the importance of that. I, I was a neurosurgical specialist with Johnson & Johnson. I was the guy, if I had a headache, I wanted to get an MRI. I was the guy that wanted to go get a blood test every six months. I always wanted to be, because I had understood that I couldn't yell out the financial wealth without my health. So I was just the opposite. I was I was never that guy that's like, oh, I don't want to go to the doctor. I was my doctor was like, oh, here he comes again. <laughs> okay, okay. So then I'll change it. I'll change it up right now. So you are what people should be. You are what people should be, but you're but I don't think enough people are. I, I absolutely agree. And once I was diagnosed, I had to make a lifestyle change, Scott. You know, I I had to lose weight because Cancer loves obesity. Uh, I had to get in physical shape. You know, I hadn't worked out in years. And, and so now I worked out, you know, I worked out today and yesterday. Um, I reduced alcohol consumption, another thing that, that, that the cancer loves. So I had to make a total lifestyle change and a reduction of stress. That's why we moved to California. That's why. I love waking up in the morning and looking at the ocean. Um, you know, I was fortunate to remarry this uh, amazing woman 10 years ago. It would be 10 years in June, uh, who's my best friend. And, and and so all of these things happened for me. And and when you went through this journey, um, what, were the, what were the things that kept you positive? What were the things that allowed you to, to keep going, to maintain, like, just energy, like joie de vivre in your day to day, because it's a very depressing situation to be in. So you were probably in the best position. You were primed for it. You understood the outcomes and the potential outcomes and the potential treatment. But so, how do you maintain that mindset? Yeah, you know, knowledge is power, Scott. And and you're right. Most people have no clue about the medical community or how to have a conversation with their doctor or to research themselves. If someone, when I get a my ankle swells, the first thing I'm going to do is Google ankle swellings. What are the reasons why ankles swell? I mean, Google is just that simple. It's the first thing I do. I want to kind of understand why why is this happening. I've always been going back to that junior high school kid. I'm taking this back. Curiosity. I've always went with, was very curious, uh, wanting to learn and grow. And and also, how did you? Okay, so you have uh, you obviously had a lot going on when this was happening in in your business and your professional and your relationships. How do you maintain this? How do you how do you balance out so that your life doesn't fall apart in shambles? Because this is also a major life changing event. Well, you know, I I give you an example during COVID. During COVID, 
I uh, was so frightened that I was going to get COVID. And thankfully, I never got COVID. My wife never got COVID. Um, I was so frightened, though, because I just literally six months before COVID had surgery. You know, I had my cancer scare. And still, you know, the one thing I, I want to say is that I, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, you're a survivor, you've survived cancer. And I understand enough about cancer to know that it's almost a day-to-day thing. I'm cancer-free today. That doesn't mean I walk, will be cancer-free tomorrow, Scott. So I look at it that way. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, cancer-free. And I know a lot of people are cancer-free for a moment. Yeah, it kind of comes back. It comes yeah. back. Also. Yeah. So I, I look at it differently. Uh, and fortunately, it was therapy. Going back to uh, because of a college teach professor, I could go off topic and then get back on topic. <laughs> my, my <laughs> lips kept like, how did you do that? I said, okay, so let's go back on topic because we were talking about COVID and, and the impact of COVID and how frightened I was. I actually, for 30 days, and I hadn't talked to my therapist for years, called him up and said, hey, man, I'm going through something here. I'm taking my temperature 10 times a day. I'm going to have my oxygen meter on my finger. I'm telling my wife she can't go outside. You know, I'm, I'm freaking out here. I need some help. And what it was determined is that I had never come, come to grip, Scott, never came to grips with the fact I was scared I was going to die when I was diagnosed with cancer. I never came to grips with that. And then he shared that in a, in a crisis, whatever that thing that's unresolved is multiplied 25 so it was unresolved, my fear that I was going to die of, of male breast cancer. And so it was multiplied 25 times with COVID. So you, you, in this point in your life, you dealt with mental health concerns because of this trauma that from, from the male breast cancer or chest cancer that were never re- resolved. You had, um, you had like physical items, like physical health and wellness, dieting, alcohol. So this was just like a major 180. So I guess, you know, the net of this conversation is after going through all this, if somebody is, is, is younger, say you're talking to me and I'm younger and I'm, I'm not paying attention because I am the entrepreneur that doesn't pay attention to my health as much as I should. I go to the gym, but I mean, I'm not paying as much. I still drink probably too much sometimes. Like I, I'm still young. So what, what are the takeaways? How do you focus on your mental health? What's the routine? How do you focus on your health, your physical health and well-being so that hopefully you, re- you de-risk the chance of something like this ever happening to you in the first place? Because this is just a tough time. You know, well, the thing, Scott, is to be proactive. And, and it starts now with as we are moving in medical technology. It, it's really about genetics. Uh, I'm BRCA2 mutated. And and that means one of my genes to their one of my parents had mutated genes or grandparents and it and it tripled down to me. And and for me that means I have a greater risk, not that I will, but I have a greater risk of prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, melanoma. Every year I get checked for those things. It, obviously breast cancer, male chest cancer was one of them as well. So, so if my advice to anyone that's 30 and older, get a, get a genetic test. Know what your possibilities are. It's a saliva sample, 250 bucks. It is well worth just knowing. And if you are in a, and you could do it for cancer as well as cardiovascular dis- disease, then you know you might just want to be cautious of, of, and you might want to have annual checkups much faster. Look, I've made a whole lot of money, man, and it does not matter. Cancer doesn't care what age you are, what color you are, any of that. Uh, and and I'm, I'm just telling you, I've seen a lot of successful people go down because they didn't take care of their health, both physical and mental. I've seen a lot of successful people me being one of it, 
that took on so much. I kept taking on more and more and then became the president of uh, sold my company in 2002. And then ran a major, major entertainment company and had artists like the OJs and Shaka Khan and Kool Aid Gang and all on, on my label. I took on too much. I was traveling. I had offices in LA, offices in Houston, offices in New York. I was in London almost every, once every two weeks. I was on an airplane almost 65% of the 70% of the time. I took on too much and imploded. So when you're taking on that much, you really have to look at your health there. I love that. And how does that change your, you know, now that it's sort of come full circle, it's actually interesting just to point. I ask everybody, I've had incredible people on this show. I ask everybody what their definition of success is and, and zero times it's ever been financial success. The people that I speak to have already achieved incredible things and, and it's never financial success. There's always another measure that they put in, but I'm curious how this refocuses your priorities. So what do you focus on now? What moves the needle for you personally, knowing that life is precious? What, what moves the needle for me is family. Uh, there was a part of that crisis in my life that I lost my family. Uh, and I'm fortunate to say I've regained my family. Uh, and I realize how, just how important that is, family, uh, and being connected. Um, and for me, that's the most important thing. It's something I continuously work on. Uh, I put effort and emphasis on working on connecting with my kids. Um, that's really important to me. What? And, and I'm curious, like, you, you're the patriarch of one of the most famous music families in the world, but there's a lot of other families that are trying to work through, you know, businesses together. I know even my girlfriend, she worked with her two sisters. And I think that from your advice, given the, given the level that you've played at, what are some of the lessons, some of the business lessons, some of the life lessons of working so intimately with family? How do you yeah. navigate that relationship? Good question, because, you know, we had the House of Darion clothing line um, that me and my former wife and, and Beyonce were partners in. Um, you know, my former wife was a stylist um, and created the image of Destiny's Child, did an exceptional job. I managed both of my daughters. Uh, they bid on my record label, Kelly Rowland. It was like a daughter. She lived with us since she was 12 years, 11, 12 years old. Uh, so I look at her as a daughter as well. Um, and it's difficult because the challenge is knowing when to let business go. And by that, what I mean, I could be talking about, you know what, I'm going to be on Scott's show tomorrow. And somehow in, my, in our kitchen, that would get to business. It would get off the fact that I was going to be on your show. It would be like, you know what? You know, maybe the next video. And, and so we could never shut it off. And when families work together, they have to be able to shut it off uh, and, and just do family time. And that's difficult. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, the Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot podcast network. So if you like this show, you'll love some of the other shows in their network. One of my personal favorites is the Hustle Daily Show. It brings you a healthy dose of irreverent, offbeat, and informative takes on business and tech news, and you guessed it, every single day. Some of their recent episodes that were my personal favorites, how AI is making fake IDs, how to meet your favorite CEO for a few thousand dollars, and also how TikTok is turning into an online mall and starting to replace QVC. If you love business, if you want to get a daily, Listen to the Hustle Daily Show wherever you get your podcast. Yeah, I, I, I see it. I see it in, in friends that work with family and whatnot. And it's you know, it's it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse because what do working what is working with family solve for? It solves for trust. You don't have to worry about trust. You don't have to worry about I mean, God forbid, you hopefully don't have to worry about the employee or the peer stealing from you or lying to you because you have that built trust. But then you have it's just because you're always in each other's space. And I think that there's, I mean, it's just a tough environment, but I think that there's something beautiful to it. I mean, the people that build the biggest, you know, you look at thinking of other famous families, <laughs> like even like the Kardashians, 
Like look at the look at the empire they built. Love them or hate them, they build incredible products and they do it all together. And there's a lot of discord in that family. There's a lot of moments that I'm sure are not so you know kumbaya and 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 happy. But I mean, there's something to be said for for what you've navigated, which I don't think there's a playbook for it either. I really don't think there is. You know, Scott, one of my proudest moments was recently when Beyonce won that that Grammy that made her the winningest, winningest uh, winner of all time. Was, was And by the way, congratulations. That's incredible. Yes. Absolutely incredible. Um, and she went up and she thought she thanked God first, and then she thanked me and she thanked her mother. And I, I thought that just said why... Uh, who she thought to thank first in her life. Uh, and I, I tell you, a tear fill. A tear, a tear fill. When you, when you, you know, when you look at everything like Beyonce and, and Solange has accomplished in, in their careers, like, what is the, what is the thought that comes to mind? I think that's the most, I'm not, I don't want to, there's so much to explore in like that particular conversation, but like the overarching feeling of the career and the life that you've built together well you know both both of these women are so 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 talent and this is their passion and um again the dna of the cheapers just talking about those 10 traits and it starts with passion and since they will we never we being my former wife and i i used to say scott you appreciate this i used to say Hey, Beyonce, if you want to be a doctor, just go to law school. And when you finish, your dad would have bought a hospital. <laughs> That's just how I thought. You know, I was like, hey, what if you pack the cuddle? You know, you're not going to work for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I've come from a I'm third generation entrepreneur. You know, most people don't know that. You know, my grandfather. Uh, was an entrepreneur. Uh, my grandmother was an entrepreneur, and my parents, both of them, were entrepreneurs. So, so, but to answer your question, you know that college professor, I know how to come back. Uh, to answer that question, you know, the thing that I'm most proud of, Scott, is both Beyonce and Solange would say hello and and kindness to the janitor the same way they would say it to the president of the United States. That's what I love, that they're just really authentic, kind people that have never really done. You know, entertainment brings about a lot. And when you think about both of them, uh, other than that, it was always a funny moment with Solange in the elevator. But other than that, they've never really done any controversial stuff that society looked at. And they've been doing this for 30 plus years. I mean, you know, that's in itself what I'm really proud of. Yeah, I love that. And you think about that, you think about the exposure they have, right? I mean, when you've been in the game for so long, if you're a good person, people know you're a good person. If you're a shitty person, people know you're a shitty person. You can't hide it. Can't 30 hide years. It. No. no. Um, I want to, so I guess... I'm going to throw it to you. I'm going to ask which direction you'd like to go. And so we sort of spoke about your journey, uh, some of the challenges you've overcome. I think that, dude, I have a lot of different things that we could go into, but I think that there's sort of like two main buckets. So it's up to you and I'll, I'll throw it to you. Maybe then like we'll do like another one next time. So I think about performance and again, like the DNA of the highest achievers in the world, or we can talk about marketing brand. Both of those are super interesting topics. What do you think is more relevant to what you're working on right now in terms of like messaging and what you want to teach over? Yeah, I look, you know, like, you know, I'm a public speaker. Um, I all over the world speaking, and that's really my focus today and really my passion. Uh, so I love talking about the DNA of achievers. What are the traits? And let me tell you, Scott, how I, I that was my first of five books that I've written. I was just on a plane one day and Back then, people don't do it as much now, Scott, but, you know, 15 years ago, t- people in first class, I finally got to move from coach to first class. <laughs> and, you know, you ask somebody, what do you do? Well, people don't even talk to each other now because they're either watching a movie or on the, listening to music. 
But, you know, people will be engaged and excited to tell you what they did. And I started thinking, man, all of these people are always so excited to tell me, but they are seeing basically the same traits. And I thought about myself and, and how my small success was, and I said, wow, so it starts with passion. What is that thing that I did? that you've identified, because that's the challenge, Scott. Most people haven't identified their passion, but passion is the fuel that energizes you. It's, it's the thing that you go to bed at night thinking about and you wake up in the morning. It's the thing you prepare for because you just love what you're doing. So, so I realized that passion is where success all starts from. Without passion, there's no possibility of extreme success because what it coexists with passion like a glove our work ethics and, and those folks that are passionate realize when you live your passion you never work a day in your life and when you see people like venus and kobe bryant god bless his soul and and, and lebron and beyonce these tiger woods these people that are the best in the world at it what people don't see are their work ethics. You know, Kobe Bryant had something called, I love it, it was called 666. And what that stood for is in the off season, he would, for six months on the off season, that's how much time he had, he would go to the gym six days a week, practice six hours a day. Think about this. In his off time, that's what he did. And you look at Stephon Curry, he shoots a thousand three pointers every day of practice. A thousand. And as most people don't understand how passion and work ethics go together. That's why these people are so successful. It's kind of like Malcolm Gladwell at Outliers, and he talk about the ten thousand hours that are required. You see, I'm getting excited now, Scott. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's good. I lose my shit, man. This is my shit. I'm all for it. Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. But when you see that, and you see those work ethics, and then you understand that these people are risk takers also. They take risks. They, they think outside the box. They're not box-in thinkers. They're by box-in thinkers. Most of us have been conditioned, Scott, that we have to do things a certain way. Since childhood, we were conditioned, like a, someone whispering in our ear why we can't do it. Well, you can't do it because you're poor. You can't do it because you're black. You can't do it because you're part of the LGBTQ community. All these reasons why you can't do it. And what we do is we're inside a box hitting walls all day long. We just bounce them against walls because we believe we can't do it. And if we invited someone at our box, they would be just like us, a bots and thinker. So the giving analogy, if I'm a hater, then I'm going to want another hater in my box. <laughs> you know, it busts. And, and so, but when you step outside of that box, there's no boundaries at all. So part of success is how we condition ourselves to think and, and not to be boxed in where we think. Like, Part of, I think, you know, my maestro says is I never did it the way everybody else did it. You know, when we came into the music industry, they were in the record industry. I was in the branding and the, the, in a branding part of the business. They didn't understand branding and endorsement. And how I'm saying, okay, Destiny's Child marketing budget is a million dollars, but if I got L'Oreal and Samsung song, now their marketing budget is $40 million. And so I I understood that coming from corporate America. You know, there's so many of those 10 traits, you know, it's about building a team. Uh, and, and, and in building a team, you have to have an amazing leader, someone that motivates people, someone that knows how to communicate, someone knows how to listen, that holds people accountable and responsible. Scott, you get me going, man. 
I bro, I I love it though. No, I know because this for hours. Because I want to unpack. I want to unpack what what you experience and and the way that you look at the world and the way that you unpack passion, the way that you found passion. You're you know you're multi generational entrepreneur and and your parents were entrepreneurs and your grandparents were entrepreneurs and your daughters are entrepreneurs and their own. Everyone's entrepreneurial. Everybody's found their passion and nailed in like zeroed in on it and then doubled down on that again and again and again. That's why you're successful. But I guess then the question is, say everyone's bought into this concept, and they should be, but the question is, how do they find that? How do they, how do they find that? Because you went through multiple iterations. You went through, uh, you went through things that you were probably less passionate about before you found your passion. I'm sure, I'm sure your daughters did too. I'm sure, I don't know at what age. I'm not as, as into their life history as I'm sure a lot of people are, but I'm sure there's other things they tried that weren't as great as what they actually ended up doing as their family. You're wrong on both accounts. You're Am lying. I? Well, I, 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 I was very focused on knowing what my passion was. I knew I wanted to be the number one sales rep in the world. That was my, I love selling. I love marketing. I, I still to this day love selling and marketing. I'm selling now, I'm marketing now. Yeah, you're right. I, 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 I always knew that. So you're saying that passion, that passion is, is it's, it's not that, the industry was the passion. It's like the activity was the passion, and you just pivot where you focus that energy. Well, and sometimes, you know, we we, we make it very complicated. I'm a, a guy that believes in simplicity. It's just because I talk about, you're right, most people don't know their passion. How about we take a pen and a piece of paper and just write down the things we love to do? How about you just start right there, just a pen and paper, and write down everything. What do you love doing? Because what most people, and you know a lot of successful people, Scott, their success is often in things that are not the norm, not the major name type of stuff, the all brand kind of stuff. And people look at them like, that's what you do. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I still this, I'm making up something, this type of widget for the oil fields. Well, it's, that's not sexy. But they could be making a billion dollars with this problem, right? But so oftentimes people get pers- dissuaded rather than persuaded to to do something because it's the cool thing. And if it's not the cool thing, then they're embarrassed to even tell people it's their passion. They're really or literally like, I'm not going to tell anybody I really love that because they don't look at me like I'm crazy. Well, that thing is probably the thing that you could be most successful with because you love it so much and you'll put in the work, you'll do the, 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 the get the research done, you'll go back to school, you'll go to seminars, you'll do all of that stuff that's required to be really successful. People just overcomplicate the shit out of it and they just, yeah. they just spin their wheels. Most of, most, most people over overcomplicate stuff life is yeah can be real simple if we allow it to be no i i love and i appreciate you know i i just assumed that day one you didn't know exactly what you want to do because i feel like that's again i think that's more me imprinting that's day one i didn't know what i want to do and and sometimes i'm trying to teach over the thing for the average person that isn't so laser focused on on exactly where they want to be. I think that's a blessing actually. And you know, if the, if the goal is to, if the, it's, it's a blessing when you get it and you're focused on it, but like, let's say the goal of this is to like get people to that spot and feel comfortable and just hang out in that spot. And that's where excellence is. A lot of it though, Scott, is parenting skills. Like, like for example, with, with Solange and Beyonce, we exposed them when they were kids. And I'm talking about five, six, seven years old, we exposed them. We would take them to science fairs. We would take them because we're in Houston. We would take them to NASA. We would take them to the medical center. We would take them to plays. We would expose them to all sorts of things. And then we would just be quiet as parents and watch what they gravitated toward. And it was always entertainment. It was always singing and dancing, what they gravitated. So once we knew that, and I always tell parents, how do you know it's a kid's passion? It's very simple. 
the day you have to tell them to go to practice or remind them to go to practice is a hobby, not a passion. It's a hobby, and that's okay. It's okay to have hobbies. A lot of people are confused about hobbies versus passion, but we knew that was our kids' passion. Sing, and so then we put them in a dance troupe, and then they got more exposure. And then someone came and said, "Hey, we'd we'll like to put Beyonce in this girl group." And so it just organically happened. Beyonce and Solange have never, ever, ever, ever said they wanted to do anything other than Because, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I loved it. Okay, so then... And so then... Woods, I guarantee, has never said anything different. As <laughs> Selena, I guarantee, has never said anything different. Think about it. These people have never wanted to be anything other than what they are. And they knew it at an early, early age. So my parents always instilled entrepreneurship, and they were, you know, they weren't highly educated, but they knew sales. And and so I always enjoyed the the opportunity to to, to sell people. Um, On me, I had to. The black kid at the white school, I had to sell you. Like, don't beat me up today, please. I had to sell sell the Scott. I, I finally understood at junior high school, man, if... I play basketball, and these white people are treating me differently. So I started really focusing on being a really good basketball player to, by the time I was a senior, I had all these scholarships. Uh, but I always do. I always knew sales and marketing was my thing. Do you think that, you know, let, let's fast forward to somebody who's later on in their in their career and they're trying to build something, they're an entrepreneur. And they're, you know, they feel like they found their passion, but shit's not working out. Like they're showing up every day and failure, 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 roadblocks, failure. Um, when when do you know that something at a, at a later stage, a good parenting lesson you just gave, but at a later stage, somebody's trying to build something. When do you know it's not a passion? When do you know it's not something that you should be doing? When do you throw in the towel? When do you double down? Yeah, that's a really good question. When do you throw in the towel? You know, the question is, have you given it all that you can give? The question is, have you done the things required? Have you got knowledge? Have you really gone and seek and sought the type of knowledge that you need to really be good at what you're doing? And oftentimes, oftentimes the answer is no. You haven't done all, you haven't checked off all the things you need to do to really be successful. That's more than not. Uh, And yes, there's always... Some, you know, times there'll be like, this just is not going to happen. I've had that happen with artists where I kept coughing up money and money and money, but my pet blinders on that they just didn't have it. They just weren't passionate about it. They didn't want to put in the, the work to be great at it. Um, and that's the same type of example. And so I experienced that in the record industry as an executive. Many times I've had to unfortunately, drop artists. And for those of you who don't know what that means, that's like when you get fired. We call it, we dropped you. Uh, you call it, we fired you. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes I had to fire up artists. It is a very difficult thing, but you then realize it's a decision you have to make for the best of the company. Uh, and, and often it's to, for the best of them. Because they just, it goes back to that passion thing. I don't know, gosh, do I know anybody that's extremely passionate that had to throw in a towel? I, I really have to think about that. I'm sure there are some people, but I have to think about it. After, after you know, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up the entrepreneur conversation, or sort of the, the high performer conversation. I guess it kind of dovetails into entrepreneurship, but... We'll finish up in a second, but I would say the one more one more question I have for you on this is: once you found that passion and you're executing, then what is the the number one DNA trait or personality trait that allows that person to maintain long? Is it grit? Is it perseverance? Is it resilience? What is the thing you see time and time again after they've identified their passion? That's the first thing, and then what allows them to grow that thing and be successful over ten, twenty, thirty years? Well, I think it's the two things I talked about. I mean, 
these successful people, they build the right team around them. You find any successful basketball player or entrepreneur or artist, they have a great team around them. So they find this the, and, and, and create the right team around them. I, I think they're visionaries. Uh, they don't go and ask Scott, I have an idea. What do you think about it? True visionaries never do that. True visionaries say, Scott, I'm about to start this business and this is what I need from you. I don't need your opinion. I need to tell you what I need from you for, to help me to be successful. And often, most people say, man, can you give me your opinion? Well, are they qualified to even give their opinion? And oftentimes, they're not qualified to give an opinion. And so that visionary, knowing that being a visionary is a lonely road, it's a very lonely road, but you accept that. Uh, you know, it's about strategic planning. That's part of one of the traits. You have to strategically plan out three years, five years. Would you ever, Scott, get on an airplane and the pilot didn't have a, 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 a mapped out a plan? of how he's going to get from Houston to Boston? No. No, I would not. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. get on that damn play. <laughs> often, we, 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 we live our lives and we live our businesses that way. We don't have a plan. We're, we're just by the state of our pants. We're flying blind in the air, as they say. Uh, so successful people think out a strategic plan. Uh, they understand how ego also can play into failure. You know what my definition of ego, Scott, is? You've never heard this. This is the Matthew Knowles definition of ego. Ego is the anesthesia that dents the pain of stupidity. I'm going to drop it to Mike. <laughs> I love it. Ego is the anesthesia that that is the pain of stupidity. Very good. Very, very good definition. And, and often that gets in the way of our success because we don't want to listen to those that aren't qualified to, to share and give information. So there's no one formula other than it has to start with passion. And then there's these other traits, I think, that goes with it. I love that. Um, if you had one final thing to tell over to a, a young entrepreneur or somebody just young in their career, it doesn't have to be an entrepreneur. It could be an artist. It could be an entrepreneur. It could be somebody who's just graduating high school or college. What would that piece of advice be? You know, I, I said it earlier, and I, I want to end with it. It's failure and mistakes are going to happen in life, in your business, Mistakes are going to happen in your life, in your business. You have to understand that that's how we learn. I have never learned, Scott, from being the most successful person in the world. As a matter of fact, there's an old saying, you know, I, some people, I want to be the smartest in the world, or I am the smartest in the world. Well, for me, it's just the opposite. I never want to be the smartest in the world. I want to walk in a room where people are smarter than me, that I can learn. And, and so that's what I would tell people is to continue to grow, continue to have knowledge. I, I speak and I do business from a place of knowledge, not from a place of emotions, because if you work in corporate or uh, as an entrepreneur or any aspect, emotions will equal failure. Because when you make those decisions, they won't be analytical. They won't be the appropriate right decision. They'll be emotional on feelings. And that'll always get you in trouble. So those are the things that I say to young people. Get that knowledge. Get that experience. Uh, humble yourself. Intern. Learn from other people that are successful. And, and let that be... You know, when I was at Zewarts Corporation, uh, I just had started there. And, and I tell this quickly, I 
I, I got to, used to go to work early and the branch manager uh, would get in around seven. I actually would get there about 645 and the Wall Street Journal was at the door and I came up with this idea like, I'm going to take the Wall Street Journal and I'm going to make the branch manager come and ask for it. And it worked. Like, nobody was there. It was 7 in the morning. People are slowly coming. He's like, anybody seen the Wall Street Journal after three or four days? And I was like, oh, yeah, I have it. He's like, come into my office. I thought, oh, shit, I'm going to get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Kids been stealing our newspapers. <laughs> he says, Knowles, why, why did you take my Wall Street Journal? I said, well, Worth, I wanted to understand... I said, I just read the business section. I just wanted to be current on when I'm, and when I'm talking to decision makers, because that's who I talk to. I talk to presidents. So I want to be able to communicate effectively with them on trends that have happened and what's going on in the, the business world. He says, I love that. He says, I tell you what, I want you to read the Wall Street every day and then come and download me every day. And so in that, I one day said, Worth, I want to be the best sales rep ever at Xerox. And I'm asking you, would you please mentor me? And sometimes part of success is asking for help and asking people and telling them you want to be the best. How do you say no to someone, Scott, when they say, you know, I want to be the very best I am one day want to have a podcast and I want it to be the very best and you're really good at it, Scott. Would you please just, can I intern for you? Can, you know, how are you going to turn that down? You, know, yeah, and, you can't and, and ever. Often it's just that easy. It's just that easy. Success. I love We it. make it so difficult. I love it. Uh, amazing. Yes. Keep it simple. Keep it simple is like the takeaway from all of this because you're right. We just spoke an hour about things that should be very basic, but are way overcomplicated, are way too conflated, way too confusing, and there there really is no need for it to be like that at all. Um, okay, let's. Okay, so where are we sending people? Uh, where do you want people to go check out all the work that you're doing? Your books, social. What's the website? Well, because I keep it simple, I send people to one place. And that's to my name, MatthewKnowles.com. Uh, and by the way, Matthew has one T in it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this joke because, you know, I grew up in Gaston, Alabama. And, and when I was born, uh, my dad's name is Matthew with two T's. And so the nurse came and said, well, Mr. Knowles, uh, at that second T, and Matthew is going to cost $1,000. He was like, forget it. What's <laughs> that? Uh, so, 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 I have one T, although my dad has two T's, I have one C. Uh, that's hilarious. But so but, funny. But I sit there with MatthewKnowles.com, and that's where you can book me to speak, uh, find out, you know, you can purchase the books there, and I'll send you out. But you'll find out everything I'm doing and where I'm doing it. I love it. All right. Um, and the last question I ask everyone after the incredible career you've had um, and, and all the things that you've gone through, what does success mean to you? Well, obviously success today just means happiness, man. It's, it's one word for me, just happiness. And how can I achieve and accomplish happiness? And, and for me, it's in a number of ways. I, I that I get joy by doing and sharing my my wisdom, my failures, my successes, my family connecting, um, my amazing wife who's my best friend. Uh, that's what I I look at success today. Uh, I don't look at you know the monetary. As a matter of fact, people I know because of their passion, they never did it for money. Yeah, you know, they wanted to make money, but they did it because they just enjoy love. I never heard people like, I'm going to do it. I have heard people in the, in the music industry say, well, I want to be an artist because I want to make a lot of money. I've never seen any you know, of those people succeed. Uh, people that are truly successful do it because they're passionate about 
because they realize they have to do those other traits I just taught. So for me, it's finding happiness. It's that happiness and joy that I get every day uh, by doing some of the simple things in life. I used to, before my cancer, I would never, when I say never, I would never look at flowers and trees and nature. That just wasn't important to me. I was running and gunning. Now I look at nature and I see the birds chirping. I look at sunsets. I have a whole, on my camera, just beautiful sunsets, things that I never did before. Those are the things that are important today for me. Those are my definition of success. Yeah.